Good morning. I'm Tom Kaczynski, Field Services Director with APA, the Engineered Wood Association. Welcome to our webinar on fire protective assemblies for lightweight floor systems. Our presenter today is Bob Kuserk. He is an engineered wood specialist with APA covering the Mid-Atlantic and the New England states. Bob is a structural engineer with a bachelor's in civil engineering from Villanova and a master's of civil engineering with a structural concentration from the University of Delaware. He joined APA earlier this year following over 20 years with a leading manufacturer and distributor of engineered wood products. During this time, he consulted with builders, designers, engineered wood dealers, and code officials regarding the design and code compliance of engineered wood products. Once again, welcome to the webinar. Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Tom said, I'm Bob Cusirk. I'm an engineered wood specialist for EAPA, based out of New Jersey, covering the Mid-Atlantic, New England area. Uh, this webinar today is intended to provide an overview of fire protective membrane requirements of the International Residential Code for Floor Systems, specifically relating to lightweight construction and the many options available to meet those requirements when iJoists are used. We provided a webinar on the same topic last year, but since then, some new tested assemblies are available, which we'll focus on today. In this webinar, we'll be covering the fire protective membrane requirements of the IRC, a brief summary of why iJoists continue to be the most popular residential floor framing systems, the most common ways for builders are complying with the IRC requirements when using iJoists, two new tested assemblies that we expect will be popular solutions to provide compliance with the code. First, we'll start with a review of the building code provisions that are driving a change in the construction practice. There have been quite a few code changes in recent years that have impacted how houses are built. One such change in the International Residential Code relates to increased fire protection requirements for lightweight floor systems. The fire protective membrane requirements were first included in the 2012 IRC. They were added to enhance the fire protection of lightweight floor systems. These are found in section R501.3 where it states floor assemblies not required elsewhere in this code to be fire resistant rated shall be provided with a half inch gypsum wall membrane, 5 eighths inch wood structural me panel membrane or equivalent in the underside of the floor framing member. The 2015 IRC moved this section to section R302.13. Additional language was included that addresses penetrations and openings through this membrane. What this section means is that all residential floors that comply with the IRC, with several notable exceptions, will need to be covered with half inch drywall, 5 eighths inch wood structural panels, or some other means to increase fire performance. This requirement will likely have the biggest impact on parts of the country where basements are common. As mentioned, there are exceptions to this requirement, as well as alternative solutions in lieu of applying the protective membrane. Both the 2012 and 2015 IRC permits four exceptions to the membrane requirement to still meet the code. Exception one includes areas protected by sprinklers. These systems are covered by IRC section P2904, NFPA 13D or other approved equivalent sprinkler systems. Some states or jurisdictions have adopted section R313 of the 2012 IRC which requires automatic sprinkler systems to be installed in all one and two family dwellings. In these jurisdictions, no additional membrane protection steps are required for lightweight floor systems like iJoist. In jurisdictions that have not adopted that code requirement, a partial residential sprinkler system can be installed. In locations where a partial sprinkler system is used, a fire protective membrane is again not required. These locations most commonly include the entire basement or specifically in those basement rooms that are not protected by a drywall ceiling or other means described in the se seminar. The American Wood Council has developed a partial sprinkler guide which is available on their website AWC. Org. The guide covers the many considerations involved in partial sprinkler design for residential applications. This can be a great option to use. Just keep in mind that this is 
only applicable for states or jurisdictions that have not adopted IRC Section R313, which requires fire sprinklers throughout the entire house. Exception 2 covers floor assemblies over crawl spaces, not intended for fuel fire appliances or for storage. Most crawl spaces do not contain furnaces, and changes to the most recent model energy codes makes it increasingly unlikely that they will be located in unconditioned crawl spaces. If a crawl space is intended for storage, builders may want to consider installing a more durable membrane to the underside of the joist, like the 5 8 inch wood structural panel alternative to the gypsum. Exception 3 allows for up to 80 square feet of unprotected areas, provided fire blocking is in place to separate the unprotected portion from the remainder of the floor assembly. This may be desirable in areas where many obstructions make the installation of gypsum ceiling difficult. And finally, there is exception four, which allows the use of dimension lumber or structural composite lumber, such as LVL, PSL, LSL, and OSL, with a minimum nominal two by 10 dimension. The code also permits the use of other approved assemblies that have equivalent fire performance to two by 10 lumber, which we'll cover later. The reason behind this code change was to focus on concerns with lightweight floor system, specifically steel framing, plated floor trusses, and eye joists in unfinished basements. So all three of these floor system types are required by code to have a half inch gypsum board or a 5 8 inch wood structural panel on the underside of all framing or provide another code equivalent means of protection. So why is this significant? Let's review the most recent data from the Home Innovations Research Lab on the residential floor systems in use today. According to their 2014 Builders Practice Survey, iJoyce framing is selected by builders and designers more than any other framing type for use in raised single-family floors in the United States, together with open web trusses, which represents 19% of the floors, and other, which includes several floor system types, including cold form steel. Fully two-thirds of lightweight raised floor framing requires additional fire protection. I'd like to briefly review why iJoyce have consistently been the leading choice of builders and then discuss how these products can be most cost-effectively used with the new code requirements. One of the biggest reasons that iJoyce have grown in popularity over the years has to do with the savings that builders realize as a result of reduced callbacks. The iJoyce manufacturing process results in high-quality, reliable products that perform consistently on every job. Consistent performance within a floor means flatter and quieter floor assemblies. Another key reason for their popularity is the longer lengths that are available, which result in fewer pieces to purchase and increased design flexibility. Fewer pieces increases profitability since time is saved during cutting and fitting. Increased design flexibility allows for more interior options, including open floor plans, and allows the designer to create floor plans that are more attractive to buyers. I joist are lighter in weight due to more efficient use of wood fiber through pre-engineering. The lighter weight in comparison with other joist products allows framers to move more quickly and easily install the joist. The efficient use of wood fiber also means that they are environmental friendly. Wood is a sustainable, renewable resource which sets apart from other building materials. I joist and other engineered wood products make optimum use of the renewable resource by putting high strength wood where it is most needed. As a result, I joist use substantially less wood fiber than lumber on the same design span basis. Long lengths and pre-cut framing packages also result in less waste, which impacts the amount of material going to landfills, which may result in reduced disposal costs for the builder. With today's rapidly increasing energy code requirements, it is more important than ever for ductwork to be in the conditioned space of the building rather than in the attic or a crawl space. With properly designed ductwork running in the floor system, there's less wasted energy and added up confidence in meeting the latest energy code requirements. These are just some of the benefits of using iJoyce, benefits that help offset the higher cost of a premium floor product relative to dimension lumber joist. So now that we have established the apparent benefits of iJoyce construction, let's look at how you can continue to use these products and comply with the membrane protection requirements of the IRC. One solution is to install the membranes as prescribed. One advantage of installing a gypsum ceiling is to offer a finished basement option to the homeowner. 
because basement wall insulation is now required by the energy code in most climate zones, frame basement exterior walls are becoming more common, especially in the colder states. Basement walls that are already framed or furred out, interior of the concrete, are a significant step towards a finished basement. Combining drywall on a basement ceiling with framing already along the basement exterior walls can provide builders with opportunities to upsell a finished basement option, which can add significantly to the bottom line. Since the code does not require that the drywall be finished, a partially finished basement option can also be sold. Not having to apply tape, mud, and the resulting sanding between coats eliminates the need for multiple visits by drywall installer, resulting in a lower cost solution. However, builders that market a partially finished or finished basement option will want to consider in advance any additional HVAC requirements that might be required to adequately heat the additional living space. The addition of drywall to the undersided joist increases the mass of the floor system and acts as a damper for vibrations. This results in improved floor performance, which increases homeowner comfort and results in more satisfied customers. This phenomenon is covered further in the APA publication Minimizing Floor Vibration by Design and Retrofit, Form E710. Also, the reduced noise transmission that results from a drywall ceiling can also help mitigate airborne noise transferred to the stories above. Although it may not be dampened all the noise created by a kitty rock band, you can refer to our APA design guide, Noise Rated Systems, for additional information on design for minimizing noise in buildings. And of course, adding drywall to a floor ceiling assembly provides improved fire protection which is the intent of the IRC code requirement. While there are many benefits to gypsum installed on the bottom of the joist, there are times when other means of fire protection are preferred. We've already talked about options that don't incorporate a gypsum ceiling, like using nominal 2x10 or larger dimension lumber, or the many structural composite lumber products that are widely available. While they are most commonly used as beams and headers, laminated veneer lumber, laminated strand lumber, and oriented strand lumber can also be used as floor joists according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Recall that we mentioned earlier that the code permits the use of other approved assemblies that are equivalent to the fire performance of nominal 2x10 lumber. This is the actual for fire performance and language is shown here. The International Code Council Evaluation Service, ICCES, provided a basis for equivalent performance to unprotected 2x10 floors and added it to the acceptance criteria for prefabricated wood eye joists AC-14. This acceptance criteria establishes a 2x10 benchmark test duration in accordance with the standard ASTM E119 time temperature exposure and loading for the eye joists. The acceptance criteria also requires that joists be tested with holes that may be permitted per the eye joist manufacturer's guidelines as well as testing of any factory installed protections applied to the joist. This durability requirement would not be needed for field installed solutions. ICC Evaluation Service Report ESR 1405 provides several field installed alternatives for meeting the membrane requirements when using eye joists. APA System Report SR 405 also provides options for builders to use eye joists similar to ESR 1405. System Report SR-405 is intended to provide prescriptive fire assemblies for fire protection of floors constructed with prefabricated wood eye joists when IRC Section R501.3 requirements are adopted by the local jurisdiction. The listed assemblies include attaching gypsum to the eye joist web where the joist has a minimum flange dimension of one and a half inches thick by two inches wide or attaching gypsum to the eye joist flanges where the eye joist has a minimum flange dimension of one and an eighth inches thick by one and three quarter inches wide. Most joists meet this minimum flange dimension requirement. Installation details for the gypsum attached to the flanges and attached to the eye joist webs are contained in the APA Systems Report 405. Systems Report SR-405 also provides attachment details that address both round and rectangular penetrations through the eye joist. Another listed option is the use of mineral wool insulation installed on top of the bottom flanges to meet the fire protective membrane requirements. This option requires a minimum wool, mineral wool thickness of two inches. It can be used in floor joists with eye joist space up to 19.2 inches, depending on the density of the mineral wool used. 
Again, this requirement and installation detail for this assembly can be found in the APA systems report. Another list, option listed in the systems report is the use of a proprietary three-quarter inch ceramic fiber, fiber blanket. The product manufacturer and details for fastening it to the eye joist as well as information on how to address penetration is also included in the same systems report. Out of all of the different eye joist protection options we've discussed so far, the most common are the two solutions found in the code, drywall attached to the underside of the joist and the use of full or partial sprinklers. Recently, two new assemblies were developed and added to the APA systems report. They are arguably the simplest and most straightforward solutions developed to date. They make use of the regular drywall cut to fit on top of the bottom flanges of the joists as shown here. There are two assemblies that can both be used on joists with a minimum flange dimension of 1 and 8 inches thick by 2 inches wide. These dimensions cover most lumber flange eye joists and some LVL flange eye joists manufactured in North America. The only difference between the two assemblies is the thickness of the gypsum used. The required gypsum thickness is governed by the joist spacing. The first assembly is used with eye joist space 19.2 inches or less on center. The second assembly is for eye joist spacing up to 24 inches on center. While eye joist spaces 16 or 19.2 is the most common, use of a 24 inch on center joist spacing is increasing in some areas of the country. This wider joist spacing often involves a switch to deeper joists and thicker floor sheathing. While the square footage of gypsum over the system remains the same, this detail results in one third fewer joist bays or pieces to protect the joist in comparison to a 16 inch on center spacing. In this case, 5 8 inch gypsum is required in place of the half inch gypsum used with closer joist spacing. As shown in these slides, there are no fasteners or adhesives required. The gypsum merely rests on the flanges with a 5 16 inch gap between it and the eye joist web at each bearing point. These options provide significant advantages in that there are no drywall screws involved, which saves on both materials and installation time. There's also no need to install gypsum around holes that have been cut through the joist. The drop-in gypsum can be easily lifted up and removed should one need access to the floor system in the future. Installation can take place at the same time as the rest of the drywall or a week before final permitting, depending on your schedule. It also helps to reduce airborne noise between living spaces and, of course, provides increased fire protection for eye joists. Before incorporating any of these equivalent assemblies, builders and designers should check with their eye joist supplier or check the APA website to see if the eye joist they use is listed in either ESR 1405 or in the APA product report assigned to that manufacturer. It should be noted that some eye joist manufacturers may have the same information provided in the proprietary ICC evaluation reports. If not listed in these reports, you should check with the manufacturer to determine if these details are appropriate with the products. One last option is to use factory installed or site applied fire protective coatings. You should note that APA does not evaluate factory applied protections. Rather, they need to be evaluated by a qualified independent certification agency competent in fire resistance of building materials and elements. A factory applied coating must meet the ICC-ES acceptance criteria AC14, which includes fire endurance, durability, and fastener corrosion requirements. One should review the ICC ES report for the manufacturer to assure that it meets the nominal 2x10 lumber exception in the IRC. You should also check with the manufacturer regarding product availability. Field applied coatings are also outside the scope of ICC ES acceptance criteria AC14. Therefore, it is important to read code reports for proprietary field applied coatings to determine their basis for equivalent performance to the code and application instructions. As a certification agency for major of I, majority of eye joists used in North America, it's our position that eye joists coated with a field applied coating must be recertified by the coating company or its certification agency for structural and fire performance. As APA has no knowledge of the chemistry or quality assurance of field product applied coatings and has not tested coating, coated joists for structural fire performance, APA cannot make fire performance or structural claims on eye joists coated with, with fire protective coatings. You should also obtain coding manufacturer's evaluation report and be sure to review the acceptability with your building department. So for review, the popularity of eye joists remains very high due to many important performance benefits 
the builders realize from their use. Most lightweight floor systems installed over basements require some sort of increased fire protection for the code. While this requirement depends on the application, it applies to both open web and plated floor trusses, eye joists, and lightweight cold form steel joists. Lumber and structural composite lumber is excluded provided the dimensions are a nominal 2 by 10 or larger. And there are many ways to provide additional fire resistance to eye joist floor assemblies, most popular being code prescribed half inch gypsum applied to the underside of the floor assembly, or partial and full sprinkler systems. Drop in panels for use with a joist spacing of 24 inches or less depending on the gypsum thickness. And the use of fire protective coatings, which only factory applied coatings can meet the ICC ES acceptance criteria AC14. For further information, you can refer to these websites for the listed publications. The APA website includes Systems Report SR 405, which was featured in this webinar, Form R425, designing to meet IRC fire protection provision for I joist floor systems as well as manufacturer-specific product reports that cover iJoyce and other APA member produced products. The Partial Sprinkler Guide is also available at the AWC website. You can download Evaluation Report ESR1405 from the ICC-ES website. For on-demand viewing, a recording of this webinar will be posted on the APA website in the coming days. Additionally, APA has many other resources available for you as well. We all need help from time to time, and APA's product support help desk is a place for answers to those questions that you run into during your work with engineered wood products. The help desk is a free service and is available to answer your questions pertaining to the specification and application of engineered wood products and systems. It's staffed by specialists who have the knowledge to address a diverse range of inquiries related to engineered wood. It's not only a fantastic resource for you, but also customers, builders, designers, and code officials. The APA Help Desk can be contacted by calling 253-620-7400 or by emailing help at apawood.org. In addition to the Help Desk, the APA Field Services team consists of full-time engineered wood specialists like myself located throughout North America. These engineered wood professionals include engineers, architects, and construction experts we are available to provide information and recommendations to construction and design professionals. We recommend that you get to know your APA engineered wood specialists in your area. Contact information for your regional field staff representative can also be found on our website, www.apawood.org. That's a lot of information to talk about how the codes are changing and requiring these uh, membrane protection requirements. I guess we'd like to open this up now and see if there's any questions that came in, Tom. Okay, thanks, Bob. We did get a few questions, and uh, we can answer some of those now. Um, <clears throat> here's one. Do drop beams need to be covered with drywall on the ceiling? Yeah, that's a good question, Todd, because code doesn't really get specific on the beams in these um, instances. Um, the intent of the code was to really address the late weight frame construction, so the, the real answer is no, the drop beams do not need to be covered with the drywall for the IRC requirement. No, the membrane protection is only required on the eye joist. And actually, one of the benefits of using the SR405 uh, drop-in panel detail that we talked about, the new detail, the detail makes it easy to cut panels, slide them in over drop beams, HVA assemblies, plumbing, any other obstructions that may be in place hanging below the joist. So that's, that's a real nice detail you know, that you can use, and it will accommodate drop beams and a lot of other interferences. Good. Thanks, Bob. Uh, what additional design criteria does APA or does an engineer need to incorporate these joists if attaching gypsum to the joists or dropping gypsum in between the joists? They really don't have to do anything, Tom. Um, we need to remember building codes don't really specify dead load requirements per se. You know, rather, it's the designer's responsibility to understand what the floor system is constructed. That includes the floor finishes, such as tile, gypcrete, which can also add dead load to the system, and design accordingly. In general, most I-Joy span tables are based on a 10 PSF dead load or 12 PSF dead load for you know, the heavier series joists, if you look in the literature. Uh, these tables are typically intended to account for the weight of joists, sheathing, normal floor finishes, and a layer of drywall already. 
So the IRC membrane protection requirement, or the SR-405 details, they really fall within this type of assumption. So really no adjustments are necessary because of these attachments that we're showing. Okay, and then uh, another question. Do you work with any manufacturers of site-applied fire coatings? Now, as we touched on a little earlier, uh, the APA is not currently working with any manufacturers of field-applied coatings. Uh, iGoist manufacturers themselves may have such relationships. Um, iGoist coated with field-applied coatings are required to show the same equivalency to 2 by 10 lumber. So right now we suggest you contact both the coating manufacturer and the iGoist manufacturer who recommended such applications and consult with the building department for their product approval to make sure these products are acceptable in your jurisdiction. Here's one where I live. It's customary to attach one by strapping to the underside of joists, uh, then to attach the gypsum board to the strapping. Is this an acceptable alternative? Okay, actually that sounds like a detail that I, I've seen quite a bit up in the New England market. Um, it's, it's common in that market for them to install strapping on the underside of joists, both 2x10 or I joists, to install the gypsum. Um, while we didn't focus on all the details of the IRC, the IRC details, um, they are covered in our, on our report SR-405, uh, specifically detail FP-01 is the first detail in that report. Uh, that detail addresses the use of strapping in call out C, which allows the use of strapping and provides connection detail for both the strapping and the gypsum. That's what a lot of this really comes down to is the, the strapping needs to be installed for the code and the, as the gypsum as well, gypsum, the code prescribes how these um, are fastened, and you can find that in the SR-405 report. I think you covered this one, but is, is a caulk required to seal the edges of uh, when using the drop-in panel solution? No, really the, the drop-in panels, um, you know, that's the, the beauty of actually of all these details is that you don't need to caulk, you don't need to finish any of these um, details, so you don't need to caulk them, they just need to really rest in between the joists. Um, similar if you were re even resting a you know, 5 8 inch wood structural panel between the joists, there's, there's no extra detailing that's required when you're doing that. So the drop-in just drops it out. It's not much different than a drop-in ceiling. You can lift them up. You can look at it. You know, you can, you can inspect it, make sure you have the spacing required just by lifting these up a little bit and taking a look. So um, it's a real easy okay. detail to, to build. And then we had a question about that. How do you confirm the spacing between the joists? So you answered that. Um, can you penetrate that drop-in gypsum membrane? Uh, yeah, the, um, that's one of the changes that came out in the 2015 IRC. They, they added the verbiage, the penetrations or openings for ducts, vents, electrical outlets, lighting, devices, luminary, um, shall be permitted. So that would be applicable to the drop-in panel detail as well, just as it would to the, the base um, gypsum requirement. I want to remind everybody to Make sure to visit apawood.org for more inf information on this topic. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.